asking to start worship. So we, um, Sarah is going to start us off with a song. And Sarah would let us hear um, joining us again today for music. So welcome, Sarah. Seek me first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. So good morning, everyone. It's good to see you and happy fourth. Um, such a, a good turnout, actually, for it being the holiday. I wasn't sure um, how many of you would be able to make it, but it's great to see you. Um, so as far as announcements, um, mostly the same announcements that we had last week, if you were here. Um, we are on our second to last week of our Perkins um, study on Acts. We've been meeting every Thursday morning at 10 a.m., at Perkins, and we've been reading through the whole book of Acts. So we've just got two weeks left, including this week. And after that, we'll start a whole new study. So if you um, have been wanting a good place to jump in and you haven't started coming yet, well, we only have two more weeks of uh, reading through Acts and then we'll start something else. So um, if you are doing that study, we're just doing chapters 25 and 26 this week. And let's see, if, you're, if you aren't free on Thursdays, but you want to be able to read along, um, let me know and I can email you the study as well. So that's an option. Um, Gloria's ordination is on July 18th at 3 p.m. So that's coming real quickly. What is that? 14 days, two weeks, two weeks from today, two weeks from today. Wow. And at the end of the day, Gloria will be ordained. And that's so cool. Um, so hopefully you can make us uh, or make it here with us at um, 3 p.m. on the 18th of July to celebrate her. Um, if not, we'll also, I'm going to have a, um, a basket outside um, at church that morning that you can put cards and stuff in. So if you want to celebrate her, but you just aren't able to make it that afternoon, um, there are lots of ways to, to get your well wishes to her. Um, Dorothy is still working on an awesome project that involves, um, it asks, asks nothing more from you than just the outline of your hand. Um, it takes about 10 seconds. So if you haven't given Dorothy your handprint yet, we want to include as many people as we can in that project. Um, so if you haven't given it to her, just um, see Dorothy after church in the blue shirt back there. And um, she will outline your hand and add you to the project. It's going to be a big fun surprise when everybody sees it. Uh, we do have iCamp coming up. So iCamp is that um, intergenerational camp. It's the camp for all ages at Cambridge West. 
and that is going to be September 3rd through 6th. So we're still waiting for uh, more information about that to come out from the region. Um, but the theme will be unplug and unwind. So just kind of about reconnecting with God and enjoying um, the company of, of others. So it'll be really fun. It'll be people from all different churches who will come together for that. So again, that's September 3rd through 6th. And I think my last announcement, um, and then I'll see if anybody else has any. Um, my last announcement is that we have our second Saturdays to Shine event that's coming up next week. So that's a monthly event that's held through the region and every month they address some kind of different topic and a different learning opportunity. So that's next Saturday. If you want to attend, let me know and we can get registered for it. Um, and the theme for next week is storytelling. So it's going to be specifically about um, congregational storytelling. So basically, how can we use um, the tools of telling stories well to kind of tell the story of who we are as a church and to um, you know illustrate illustrate our uh, mission and such to others through telling our story in a good way. So, so I think it'll be interesting. So if you want to attend, just let me know and we'll get, we'll get signed up for it. Are there any other announcements? Yes, Mary. So we will be in hosting Town Promise again on July 11th. We're we'll hoping to build it again for three weeks in July. And then after that, it will back and forth as people, churches start to open up. But what I really need is some strong bodies right after church to the blessed house. You don't have to move it upstairs, you just have to move it from the hallway into a room. So, Strong bodies right after church. Okay. And I also want to thank Springing Takers Beautiful New Furniture for the parlor. It's gorgeous. Yes. And the parlor furniture up for the town house. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that. It's beautiful. So, thank you. Yeah. So, I'll just uh, recap that real quick. I forgot we were going to start taking the microphone around, and I forgot that. But I'll recap it for anyone online or anyone who didn't hear. So, we're, we have had like a little bit of a break from hosting for Family Promise while um, we got everything deep cleaned and just got it ready to host again. Um, took a little break. And so, starting July 11th, we're going to start hosting again, and we'll host for three weeks. Um, but what Mary needs the most help with is if you are able, she needs help moving furniture upstairs right after church. So if you can join her right after church to help move some furniture, um, just let her know. And also, she said thank you to Kay and Bernie. They donated some uh, living room type of furniture to the parlor, a new couch, and it looks really good. Um, they also donated a little chair to me for my office, and it's just the most comfortable thing ever. So thank you so much for, for sharing all of that with the church. Well, any anything else? Yeah, Bernie. Uh, my main uh, charge members for the Bible study uh, on Thursday was just for information. I received yes. word uh, that I, I received word on Monday that uh, uh, Phyllis Hart passed away. Uh, she was a lovely lady, a wife of Jack Hart, who was our pastor here in this church through the 60s and early 70s. Um, and we kept in touch with her over the years, and just a lovely, lovely lady. But she was just for her 85th birthday when she passed away. I do have contact information with her two daughters. That you know, I was interested in, in contacting them. Okay. Thank you for sharing that with me. Does anyone else have any other announcements while I'm out here? Okay. All right. Well, then, we start with our opening prayer. Creator of all. We open our hearts, minds, and souls to worship you. Be with us and inspire us this morning. Help us to love one another more deeply, to care for each other in new and necessary ways, and to seek out all who need community and a sense of belonging today. Amen. I do have a small typo in verse four on this song. It says, will you leave the you you hide? But it should say, will you love the you you hide? Which is 
you know, a difference. Do you think it's going to be really easy for me to get water in there? 
What's going to happen? I'm probably going to make a mess, right? Should we try it? Okay. So, so some water might make it in there. Maybe. If I really feel well, I can let open the pitcher for a while now. Now it should come up. There. Now we'll make a mess, right? Where's it going? Pretty much. So what do I need to do if I want to put water back in the bottle? It's okay. It's only water. So we want to unscrew it, right? We need to unscrew the cap. And now, is it going to go in? Only if I'm careful, right? Much easier, right? Okay. You can put the cap back on that. So today in our scripture, we're going to hear about Jesus sending out disciples. Okay? And Jesus says this really strange thing. He tells them that some people might not listen. And he says that if they don't listen, it's okay. Go to the next person. So like this water bottle, if this water bottle is us as people, sometimes we're closed off, right? We don't want to listen. We don't want to hear things. Any of you out there have any idea what that's like? Don't want to listen. Don't want to hear things, right? But sometimes we can choose to be open. We can take the lid off and we can listen and we can be ready to receive, right? Which way do you think we're going to get more of Jesus? By opening us up, right? So we want to always choose to be open to Jesus. Will you pray with me? Get your hands peace. Dear God, thank you for Jesus and the disciples who kept offering your love and healing to all who would receive it so that we can then share your love and healing with others. Thank you and amen. Thank you for joining me today. Our scripture reading today is from Mark 6, verses 1 through 13. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is it not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and, and Jose and Judas and Simon, and not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could not do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went out among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began sending them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. 
the word of God for the people of God. So I can't uh, possibly count the number of times in my life when I have been asked about my hometown. And this has always been a hard question because I have lived in so many different places. But when I think about my hometown, I always think of one place in particular, Caldwell, Kansas, a small farming community on the border of Oklahoma. Caldwell was home from eighth grade until just before my junior year when I moved to Tennessee. While all small towns in America have a few things in common, I do think that each town has something that makes it unique and sets it apart from all of the other places in the whole world. And if I asked you to name a few things about your hometown that make it particularly special, we probably all have different answers, even those of us who've lived in Helena forever, right? There's different things that make it special for different people. And when someone mentions my hometown, I think about the annual homecoming festival and the Kalachi festival and the Chisholm Trail festival. And I think about walking with my friends to our only video store, Spanky's, where we would buy as many Laffy Taffies as we could and rent as many movies as our allowances or part-time jobs would allow. And I also remember sitting around the kitchen table at my best friend's grandpa's house and listening to him tell us all of these wild stories about going noodling for catfish, which is when you stick your arm in a, a hole and the, let the catfish grab a hold. It's a little scary sounding to me. Um, but he would tell us all these crazy stories and all these historic tales about this mysterious prohibition era tunnel that ran under our main street. And as much as I couldn't wait to just grow up and get out of that town, Caldwell will still always have a very, very special place in my heart. And you don't have to listen to the radio too long before you'll hear an artist playing a song that pays tribute to their own hometown. For example, one of my favorite artists, Dolly Parton, describes her beloved Tennessee mountain home as a place where life is as peaceful as a baby's sigh and crickets sing in the fields nearby. Home is also a popular theme in film. In The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy famously proclaims, there is no place like home. And as much as many people have fond memories of their hometown, it isn't always easy to return to the place that we once called home. While this place gave us, us roots and watered us, and sometimes we find though that when we venture back there, we've kind of outgrown that garden. The welcome we receive when we return isn't always exactly what we'd anticipated. And the place that we remember doesn't always look or feel that much like the place that we encounter now, years later. And we ourselves, we're really not the same people that we were then either. We've grown and we've changed and our relationship to our hometown can become complicated. I have a friend who decided to visit his hometown after really having made something of himself. He'd grown up and he had changed his views some, and he really came to discover who he was as a person. He had been traveling for a long time and working in humanitarian work, and he really felt like a sense of purpose with what he was doing with his life. He felt like he was making a real and tangible difference in the world and really doing everything he could to serve God. And I can't remember if it was like a holiday weekend or what, but on this particular weekend, he decided that he would visit home. After all, he was overdue for a visit and he could already hear his aunt's curious voices asking his mom when he was finally going to visit. It was just time. And he felt like people would be really excited to see him. I mean, he knew that he was excited to see them and they would really wanna to listen to him tell them all about his experiences. He thought they'd be really proud of him and the man that he'd become. And as much as he put it off, this was a trip he was actually really looking forward to. He figured he would spend most of his time catching up with family and seeing a few old friends and visiting some of the local establishments that he loved so much growing up. And of course, he'd go visit his church, right? 
The people in his church had supported him and really been there for him as a kid. And he just couldn't wait to see them again. So as he pulled into town, he realized that it didn't really look like anything had changed. Not much. There was still the local shoe store where he used to go with his mom to buy shoes, to run and play with all of the neighbor kids and to play all of these games. And there was the local farmer's market where they would go every Saturday to buy fresh produce for the week or, of course, fresh fish. And looking at the seafood stand, his mouth began to salivate just thinking about the last fish fry he'd attended. He wasn't lucky enough to be from a coastal town, but he was just a little ways down the road from one. And everything was as he'd remembered, home sweet home. He'd even been invited to speak at his church where he would share all about his travels as a missionary. What an honor. As he started preaching and updating his church family on everything that had happened in the last few years, everyone was pretty shocked. They couldn't believe everything he'd done and the way that he spoke. He was just a really gifted public speaker and he was really persuasive. Okay, <laughs> okay. At this point, you might uh, realize that I'm talking about Jesus. <laughs> So now I didn't lie. I didn't lie because I said it was a story about a friend, right? Well, anyway, so Jesus is speaking at the synagogue and everyone is just amazed. They're asking one another, where did this man get all this? How does he have this much wisdom? Look at all these powerful works being done with just his hands. How? And at first, they're really curious and astonished even. But quickly, this turns to skepticism. And that skepticism turns pretty quickly to anger. They think, wait, isn't this the same guy that just worked as a carpenter like a few years ago? You know, Mary's son? We know all his brothers and his sisters are sitting right over there. So who does he think he is? We know this kid. We saw him growing up. And we've known him since he could hardly walk around without holding on to all the furniture. And now he's claiming to be something special, something maybe better than us. No, not at all. I mean, just picture it. This is like if the guy who used to work in the lumber department of our local Home Depot, who cut boards for you anytime you needed it, he suddenly showed up at church with this incredible gift of prophecy with lots of people claiming he was the Messiah, or at least someone really special and different. And you thought, sure, that guy at Home Depot was nice enough, and he seemed pretty smart. But the Messiah, the Son of God, get out of here. That's just Jesus, Mary's son. You know, that older woman who lives down the street, you know, she's lived there since before I was born. You know, he's just an average guy, another blue collar worker. This can't be the king they've been waiting for, right? And in Mark's telling of the story, the people are just described as taking offense at him. But in Luke's narration of the same event, the people are super upset and they drive Jesus out of town and even try to run him off the edge of a cliff. But in today's account, Jesus just answers them by saying, prophets are not without honor, in their home, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own homes. And this is an old Jewish proverb that those listening probably would have recognized. And Jesus realized that in order for his gifts to work and for him to really help people, they had to have faith in his abilities and believe he could actually do it. So that was clearly not going to happen here. These people could not believe. And he actually couldn't believe their lack of belief. And one of the things that makes hometown so special is tradition and their ability to remain almost just like you left them. And one of the things that makes prophets so special is their ability to challenge norms and traditions, to shake things up and to make you think differently about your life and to leave you changed. And so unfortunately, trying to mix these two things can be like attempting to mix oil and vinegar. You'd probably be better off just moving along, moving along to the next town. And so Jesus healed the few sick people he could, and then he headed to the other villages to teach. 
villages that would hopefully, re hopefully receive him more warmly than his hometown had. And I'm sure that this rejection had to have hurt. But Jesus probably thought, hey, y'all don't have to listen to me. There are many other people who will. And I'm not going to let this rejection just throw my whole mission off course. Because there's still a lot of work to be done. And that's where the first part of the story ends. And next, Jesus calls his 12 disciples together to send them out in pairs to minister to the villages. There are a lot of people out there who really need to be healed, and they can accomplish more if they split up and they just cover more ground. And so he tells them to take the bare minimum with them, a staff or walking stick, sandals, and one tunic, the one they're already wearing. No food, no bag, and not even any money at all. No, they are to rely entirely on the hospitality of the people that they encounter while they're traveling. And now I'm not sure how lightly you travel, but I bet that none of you have probably ever traveled just like this. Kit and I went on a two week road trip about a month ago and we spent months planning and saving. Our Jeep was packed full of all of the essentials, a snack bag, a cooler full of drinks, clothing for every occasion under the sun, phone chargers, and even a fishing pole. We are not really like packers. <laughs> we were prepared for anything, just in case. And that's really the opposite of how these disciples were instructed to travel. And Jesus tells them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. And if any city is unwelcoming to you and refuses to listen, just shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. If you've spent some amount of your life in the church, you probably are familiar with the practice of foot washing. We find a story about Jesus washing his disciples' feet in John. And maybe you've even attended a foot washing where you washed someone else's feet or had your own feet washed or both. And in a time when people mostly traveled by foot, wearing sandals without very much protection and walking miles and miles on dusty roads, a person offering to wash another person's feet was the ultimate act of care and hospitality. This statement about dusting your feet off has a few meanings, but one of the suggested meanings is that this is a statement about the lack of hospitality and welcome shown. If a person has to dust off their own feet, they've clearly not been treated that well, not as well as they should have been. And so this section of scripture can be viewed as having two distinct parts. So the first is Jesus's encounter in the synagogue, and then the second involves his instruction to his disciples. And at first, you might kind of wonder how these two sections um, are really connected or why they've been read together. And it took me a minute to kind of figure that out as well. But eventually I came to understand that these two stories are both about home. What makes a home a home? What makes a person really feel welcome? And this story isn't just about home, but it's also about rejection. It's about what we are to do when we face rejection, especially if that rejection comes from the place where we are supposed to be most welcome and loved. After just having experienced rejection in his own hometown, Jesus prepares the disciples by helping them understand how they are supposed to respond if they face the same sort of hostility while they're traveling. And the author of Mark tells us that the disciples were pretty successful. So we can assume that they found a warm welcome in most places and that all of their essential needs um, were met somehow. And they were traveling to communities where they'd likely never been before. And they probably feared that they maybe wouldn't have been greeted very warmly, or maybe they would be viewed as unwelcome foreigners. But the disciples appear to have been receiving the same kind of warm welcome that Jesus had hoped for in his own hometown but not received. And there's a lot of talk today about the homeless crisis in America. During the pandemic, a moratorium was put in place to ensure that any Americans who were financially impacted by the virus wouldn't end up on the streets. 
And in recent weeks, this moratorium has been in the news a lot because it will soon expire and they're expecting a lot of evictions to happen in every neighborhood across the country. And this is really something to be concerned about. But I also think that the word homeless can have more than one meaning. You see, there are many among us who, though they do have a roof over their heads, still find themselves quite homeless. There are many who don't feel welcome in the home that they grew up in, or maybe the town that they grew up in because of their beliefs or anything else about themselves. And there are others who don't feel comfortable in the church that they once attended every week, the church where they were baptized or dedicated as an infant. And there are people who've been forced to relocate to a new place out of necessity to find work or to flee violent situations at home and more. And now they find themselves in a new place that doesn't really feel anything like home, but they can't go back to home. And you see the word homeless can have more than one meaning. And anyone who has been ostracized from their family of origin or simply been born into a family in which they've always felt they just couldn't possibly have anything less in common with those around them, they'll understand that sometimes family can be chosen. Sometimes friends become family and your blood relatives, unfortunately, can just kind of become a distant memory. And sometimes the place you were born or where you once called home can just kind of become a vague recollection. Or maybe for some people thinking of home can be kind of traumatic, depending on how that time was there. And you find yourself setting out to find a new home, a new place of belonging, where you can really be loved the way you deserve. And in our church, we have been blessed with the gift of family. Some of us come from wonderful and super accepting families that have always made us feel cherished and worthy of all the love and support in the world. But for some of us, this church has provided us with a second chance at having the family that we always wanted. We've been given an opportunity to know what family is supposed to feel like for the first time ever. A few days ago, I had the privilege of eating dinner with most of our elders at our monthly gathering. And at the beginning of our meal, we passed around communion and served one another one by one. We were asked to share one positive thing that God had given us that we had never asked for or expected. And when my turn came, I shared that I never expected to find such a wonderful and loving church family here and that I had never in my whole life expected to live in Montana. But I was given the second family I never knew I would have, the family that I didn't even know I needed, I have a really good first family. And as each person, with, with each person, the elder served, uh, with, this happened with every person who took communion, the elder served me uh, some juice that they poured into a small cup. And then they looked me in the eyes and they said, God has filled your cup. And even though we were sitting on a porch where it had to be no less than 90 degrees, hearing these words gave me goosebumps. And I have goosebumps right now hearing those words because I thought to myself, wow, God really has filled my cup. And as I listened to those gathered share how God had filled their cup, I found myself getting emotional as I thought about how all of their cups just overflow with blessings for others. One person shared that God had filled their cup by giving them the opportunity to work with such special kids. Every day, this person fills each of those kids' cups and helps them to have a place of belonging and a sense of worth. And another individual shared that God had blessed them with a home and a safe place to lay their head at night. And I couldn't help but think of the countless hours that I know they've spent pouring their sweat and elbow grease into building homes for Habitat, humanity, Habitat for Humanity every single week. Homes for people who would have otherwise not had any home at all. God has filled our cups and now those cups get to overflow for the betterment of all. And for me, this is what true hospitality looks like. And this is what home looks like. 
This is how welcome feels because welcome is more than just a greeting. Welcome is an active verb. Welcome is something you do and something you live out day by day. And home doesn't just have to be a physical structure or a specific town or anything else. Sometimes home is simply the place where you find belonging, where you feel most safe and loved and affirmed. And while we can't just snap our fingers and instantly build a home for every person without one or erase the painful memories some people associate with their hometown, we are all capable of creating spaces of belonging and extravagant welcome. In fact, we do it every time we invite a friend to come to worship with us. We do it every time we profess from this table that all are welcome at Christ's table. We do it every time we greet a newcomer with a smile rather than a suspicious look. We do it when we host the unhoused with family promise or exchange a simple, how's it going? with someone walking into the basement of our church for an AA meeting. And with all of these actions, we profess that God loves each of us just as we are, and that this is a place where you are welcome and beloved simply because you're you, and simply because God made you. At some point, most of us have experienced rejection, and each of us knows what it feels like to be unwanted or to feel like you might be alone in the world. And for some of us, it's a fleeting feeling that just comes and goes. But for others, it's this feeling of unworthiness and pain can become their home. It's the dreadful place that they live day in and day out, just waiting for the day when someone will notice their worth and affirm them. And I wonder, who do you know that needs to experience community today? Do you know someone who has been cut off from their blood relatives or someone lacking a connection to family members and in need of a new family? Someone who might be no longer welcome at their previous church for whatever reason, or someone who might be spending this holiday alone, just waiting for someone to come along and notice them and care enough to invite them to join in on the celebration. Just longing to finally be celebrated. As Christians, we are called to extend hospitality to everyone that we encounter. And part of that hospitality involves recognizing the worth of each person and noticing when anyone has been forgotten or excluded. So how can you show hospitality and love today? After all, we're all in this together, right? Amen. Now, as we come to our time of prayer, do we have any prayer requests? I'm going to take the microphone around <laughs> so that we don't have to repeat. Yes. I shared last week that my brother Ron was Thompson on our Pantheon list, and I'm very interested in the March. And he's really doing very well. Continue prayers for his family and for his family. So, yeah. Who else would like to pray as a pastor? Anyone else back here? Mr. Andrew Marston announced on Thursday to his family that he was accepted into three graduate programs and accepted to go to, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He's going to Luther Seminary in Minnesota and start his call to the Okina Arts. So, ooh, ooh. No need for apologies for very proud of him. Anyone else? Any other? Uh, no, we're in our channel failures to have family and prayers. Anything else? Or anything else? Um, happy to do. Yeah. Um, I live in an apartment house. It's for considered transition house. One of our tenants is a family. She raised her two children all over. Now, all of a sudden, we have minimal problems. And she, she told me about this. This morning, they were over at the end of the night, and she 
at 6 o'clock in our waiting room, she went for her side of the soul at 2 o'clock. And she just she's a lost soul. So we need to go see special people. So they just wear your price. Well, speaking of Rita, that's my mom's name, and she will be coming here Tuesday, so on two days, she's going to stay all week with me. So excited! So if you do come to our Thursday morning, I will tell you'll get to meet her there and come back her mom. And um, if you don't, then she'll be here at church next week. So I'm so excited she lives in Virginia, and it's going to be awesome to have the whole week with my mom. Um, and so if you're going to ask the child, she'll be flying in to help. We're just really excited. Little girls week. It'll be fun. Well, if there are no other prayer requests, then please join me in prayer. God, maker and lover of all, who knows us best of all, help us to love ourselves. Help us to listen to your voice when you tell us that we are beloved. And we are deserving of your love and the love of everyone around us. Help us to recover quickly in those times when we experience rejection and to grow from that experience somehow. God, it can really hurt. And it can be so disorienting when we aren't sure if there is anywhere we can really call on or anyone we can really call family. May we know that you are ever present and always with us. May we also rejoice and thank you for the gift of chosen family we found together here in this place. You have given us the gift of community and fellowship. You have blessed us with companions for the journey, people to build us up and encourage us, and people capable of embodying your presence in a tangible way. Help us to recognize the gift that that is. Teach us to follow you and to care for all who are close to us, to protect anyone who is threatened, to welcome anyone who's been rejected, and to comfort those who are burdened by guilt or shame or loneliness or isolation. Help us to do all we can to heal those who are broken or sick, to share with those who have so little, to take time to really know one another, to notice who is hurting, and to love one another as you love us. Teach us to spread compassion to those in our own homes, our neighborhood, and also to those who are far away in whatever way we can. Teach us to speak for those who cannot speak, and to advocate for anyone who is oppressed or abused or exploited in any way. Help us to make peace for those who suffer violence in any form. Guide us as we work to heal the hurting rather than inflict more pain. You have taught us how to love. You have shown us what it looks like through the example of your son. Now help us to live that love out day in and day out. Help us to share a genuine welcome. And we ask all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to welcome and to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
As I thought about scripture today, I was reminded of many times in my life where I have been closed or chosen to stay closed, both to the person trying to give me or share some wisdom or some information or some knowledge with me, and to God. Um, Times in my life where I thought that I knew best and I would be in control and I would know what to do. And unfortunately learned very painfully that, you know, sometimes God just really is in charge and we just really need to listen. Um, And one of those that comes to my mind a lot lately is with my mother. I was adopted and my mother and I didn't always see eye to eye. And I resisted my mother for a very long time. And one day, and I don't really know how it happened, but one day I chose to be open to my mother as my mother and not as all of the expectations that I had of her, but my mother simply as a fellow human being struggling in this world as I was struggling, challenged by this world as I was challenged, just another human being. And suddenly I got a totally different vision of my mother because I was willing to be open. And I began to understand things about her and her faith that I would never have seen had I stayed closed. My mother lived a beatitude life. My mother was humble. My mother was kind. And I didn't see it until I was willing to choose to be open to her as a person. How often, even at this table, do we come forward or sit in our seats and take that bread and take that cup with all of the world's expectations weighing on our hearts? How often do we let ourselves be closed even to this table? I invite you today, as Laura Jean gives us the words of institution, to take a breath and to let go of the world and to see the table as God intended it and affirm with me that all are welcome at Christ's table. And now, as we do each time we gather together, we remember Christ in the same way that he taught us on the night when he was betrayed. 
He took the bread and once he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body. It is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Do this also in remembrance of me. For Christ said that every time that we eat from this bread or we drink from this cup, we tell the whole world who he is until he comes to be with us again. All are welcome at Christ's table. Let us pray. Author of wisdom and grace and mercy, we offer up our hearts to you. We offer up our hands to you. We offer up ourselves to you. Help us to remain open and to choose every moment to be open to you and to one another so that we might see the world as you have created it, beautiful and wonderfully made. Amen. Things are still not as normal as they have been. We are still adjusting to this life where we don't come forward and leave our offerings at the front. We can leave them at the back. There are boxes at the back. Um, some folks online, if you choose to give, you can give through Givelify. We do have that option. You can also mail checks into the church. Um, you can you can mail in those as well. But as gifts we receive at this table, your time, your talent, and your treasure are all needed. Every single one of you brings gifts to the table, and your gifts are different than mine, and different than Laura Jean's, and different from each other. But all are necessary. Because when all are welcome at the table, it also means that all are needed here. We thank you for your time, your talent, and your treasures, the gifts you bring every day to the lives that you touch and to the life of this church. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. 
The next one is take the peace of God with you as you go. Take the seeds of God's peace and make them grow. this week because we're working on upgrading our technology, which is great. So we've got a tablet and a computer and we're going to test those and see how they work. So soon we should have a computer for the back that doesn't freeze up, right? So that'll be great. Um, but for our benediction today, may the God who created a world of diversity go with us as we embrace life in all its fullness. May the son who teaches us to care for strangers and foreigners go with us as we try to be good neighbors in our community. May the spirit who breaks down our barriers and celebrates community go with us as we all find the courage to create places of welcome. Amen. Go in peace. And happy 4th of July. Kind of forgot. It's Monday. It's weird.